or the cool stuff for you. So that's awesome. I, I just always default to just say like, these are the things that are provable on my resume and nothing more. So maybe I'll talk a little bit about myself at some point. But anyway, um, very quickly, just so you know, going in what we're going to be doing, the goals for our session, you guys are going to gain an understanding of real time 3D in the broadest of sense. So we don't like to assume anything on these uh, introductory uh, workshops. We want to make sure that everybody's at the same level. And that means that we're going to be talking about things from the beginning. So our goal is that when you walk away from this workshop at the end of uh, our time together, you're all going to have the same level of knowledge because that's what we hope uh, is kind of like what you're hoping to get out of this. So you'll all feel like you have a good foundation to build on going forward uh, with Unity if you decide to learn a little bit more about our uh, technology. So you're gonna get confident with the essential features of the Unity editor. That means you are gonna be dipping your toes into Unity. It's not scary, it's fun, it's gonna be great. Um, you're gonna learn, around, uh, learn how to move around a 2D and 3D space and how to move objects in 2D and 3D space. That doesn't sound like much on the surface, but those are the biggest steps that you need to take to get into the real time world. Very briefly, this is our session outline. Um, we're gonna do quick welcome. That's what we're doing right now. So we're already in it, yay. Um, then we're going to talk about what real-time 3D is. We're going to talk about the Unity essentials in the editor um, and creating and customizing some objects. And we hope to have some time for Q&A at the end. So let's actually just dive right in with perhaps the most important yet most existential question there is. Thomas, who are we? It's, very, it's a very terrifying question to ask yourself on a Saturday <laughs> afternoon. Like, who... Who am I? Afternoon. Um, it's not noon for me yet. This is Saturday morning, sir. You're right. You're right. You are on the <laughs> West Coast. Um, so yeah, I think Jude gave us a great introduction, but my name's Tom or Thomas. Um, and I work here at Unity as a technical marketing advocate. And so a lot of my day is spent doing exactly this, integrating with different communities and helping y'all find ways to learn real-time 3D skills and kind of advise folks on where to go and how to engage with experiences that are designed by Joy. So Joy, tell them a little bit more about yourself. Yeah, I, I just, uh, so my work is all about making cool stuff in Unity to encourage people to get excited about our technology and just build stuff. Um, so I've been working with the Unity engine for 12 years now, and I've been working with Unity Technologies officially for just over five at this point. And throughout my journey as an educator, my entire goal has been trying to put this technology into the hands of people who have stories to tell. And that means people like you. Uh, technology should not be a barrier to sharing your story with the world. So it's my goal to make things as uh, open and available for everyone so you can go and do the cool things with it. So that's me. Yeah. And fun yeah. fact about Joy is Joy is one of my Unity mentors. At least I consider her to be so. Uh, we met with her working on Unity and a bunch of my Unity knowledge came from taking courses that Joy designed and Joy worked on. So, <laughs> But fan. I wouldn't have had those courses available <laughs> if not for the business that Thomas was uh, in. So <laughs> right. it's all like this interlinking thing. But like, oh, thank you, Thomas. I I think it's just a matter of who got to the engine first. I'm sure if like things had shifted, it would be the other way around for sure. But what's fantastic about this is that uh, Thomas and I work really well together and hopefully we will keep you entertained during this workshop time. So why don't we start off with the next hardest question past who we are? And that is, boop, 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 boop. Thomas, what is real-time 3D? Yeah, so real-time 3D is the ability to quickly render detailed 3D images. So you could actually just take the word quickly and replace it with real time and you've now defined itself, right? When we say real time 3D, we basically mean you're making something 3D in real time. You're making it now. You're not waiting for it to render. If you ever played games on the PlayStation 2, that was the big debate, right? Is this pre-rendered video or is this at runtime? right? Everything that we talk about with Unity, for the most part, is real time. It's runtime. And that's what we focus on. Another great way of looking at it is to um, think about some of the animated films that have come out in the last few decades. I think a wonderful example of this, just because I have the numbers off of the back of my head, is if you've ever seen the film Finding Nemo, there is a scene where uh, there is a school of jellyfish just flowing across the uh, the entire frame and each one of those individual frames and in film 
there's 24 frames in a second. Each one of those frames took 11 days to render. And what that means is that for 11 days, the computer was sitting there just chugging and trying to draw this image. And um, while that had a lot of very complex mathematical things going on, which is why the render took so long, that's what we call pre-rendering, where a computer's doing something off on the side and you're seeing the results later. Unity does everything like that at once. Now, Unity isn't quite at finding Nemo levels yet, but at the rate of technology, soon enough, we are going to be able to do uh, in one second, in a millisecond, what uh, that Finding Nemo uh, scene was taking 11 days to do. So that's where we're working towards. Real time is constantly getting faster with each new step in technology with each passing year. So we're really just eliminating the wait time. We're just getting right to the, what's the exciting stuff? Let's see it now. So that's what we're doing with real time and what Unity is working towards, just yeah. making Finding Nemo in real life. <laughs> and the cool thing about that, right, is because of that, that means there's industry opportunities globally because these studios need people that know how to use this tech because it is so applicable, right? And so we're being used in places like Pixar and Disney, and we're also being used you know, in gaming and in architecture and in construction because they're finding, hey, instead of having to build something slowly, we can just make a digital replica of it and test it here before we commit to things and that's speeding up workflows. So it becomes really important to know these things. Yeah, and even outside of the entertainment industry, uh, Unity and other real-time technologies are being used. Um, if you've seen on the news where they've done um, estimations on how like far a flood will move inland and they actually show visualizations of that, that's using real-time 3D technology. So even serious sectors and scientific sectors are making use of Unity. And so this is not just a skill for, oh, I wanna build something fun. This could be really skills that you learn to make a true difference in the world in the scientific field, if that's something that you wanted to do. So exactly. real-time 3D engines, which is closely related <laughs> to real-time 3D. So where does, real-time 3D come from? So <laughs> it's, I mean, it's tough to, there's a lot of ways to define this, but I kind of like to look at it as, it's a stack of included solutions to let you move faster. Mm -hmm. So one example I like to give is light, right? Like we know scientifically that when light comes from the sun, it hits a thing and then it bounces a certain way and that's how we see it. But I'm not good at math. So if you were to ask me to calculate how light bounces, I couldn't do it, right? But we already have a lighting solution in Unity that is handling all the physics of light. And it's handling the physics of two objects colliding with one another. And it does those things. So instead of you as the creator focusing on how does light refract off of a window, you can just say, you know what? The sun is over here and it shines down this way. And you can start iterating on your creative ideas faster because those things are already solved. So you can work smart, not hard by working with solutions that have already been built. One way that I like to look at uh, 3D engines, uh, and I use this actually referencing a lot when I'm talking about Unity, is Unity as something like a stock pot for where you're cooking. You yep. come in with the recipe and you have all these different ingredients and Unity is the thing that brings everything together. So your thought of, oh, well, I want a sunny sky. Boop, you put that in the pot and then Unity produces that sunny sky for you. Right. So you bring the vision and we bring the tools to support and make that vision come to life. Which speaking of specifically, Unity, because we Yay. are a real-time 3D energy <laughs> engine. So yep. what is Unity? We just said we're a real-time 3D engine. <laughs> so yeah, we already kind of identified it, but just a quick rundown, right? We're a real-time 3D engine, like Joyce said. Uh, we help you make all kinds of stuff, games, applications, films, digital experiences, VR, XR. And then, you know, studios use this to make games and all kinds of things. And you can use your own code and art, but we actually come with a lot of stuff to help you. So if you don't want to write code, you can use visual scripting. If you just want to lay things out and look around, you could just do prototyping and gray boxing. If you're not an artist like I'm not, you can go to the asset store and download assets there and put them into your application. So it lets you kind of do whatever you would like to build these experiences. And the cool thing about this is that... Uh, constantly we're finding new use cases for Unity. Um, when Unity first started, we were just a game engine. We were used to make games. That was it. Yep. But since then, we've exploded, like I mentioned, into so many different sectors, but it's not even just that. People are looking at Unity as a set of tools and making it work for them in whatever way they want. Right. I think a great example of this is um, I have an instructor friend who's 
wife works in the theater. She uses Unity to virtually set up where all of the props on the stage are going to go because they're heavy, right? So rather than making her students constantly move them around on the stage, they use Unity to figure out where they want everything to place, uh, where everything needs to be placed, and then they just place it once and they're good to go. So that no saves saying, a lot of yeah. time, a lot of effort, and people's, you know, pulled backs. So it just makes life <laughs> a lot easier. So on that note, um, like Thomas mentioned, there are so many resources. And sometimes when you want to learn a piece of software, you don't want to have to worry about all these different elements like art, like programming, like sound, all of this. Uh, instead, you just want to get in there and get a feel for the software. And Unity actually has a great solution for this through the use of templates, which is what we're going to be showing you in the engine today. So we are actually going to enter the part where we're going to dive into the engine and uh, actually do stuff within Unity. If you want to follow along with us, we actually are formatting uh, this section of the top where we'll have pauses so you could actually move around or ask questions. Um, so. Uh, I'm basically going to just kind of be uh, the sign poster from this point on, and Thomas is going to dig into the engine. So I'm going to say, hey, this is what you're going to see Thomas uh, go and do. He's going to show us Then we're going to come back, and I'm going to reiterate what he did. And so if you want to follow along with us, then you can. If not, uh, this is being recorded, so I'm sure you can go back and reference it later. But basically, we're setting up an environment so you, you could play with us if you are so inclined. So exactly. with that... Thomas is going to start by showing us the starting point for Unity, and he's going to create a brand new project and show one of our great templates, which is in the form of a micro game. So you're going to be able to dig right in and see what Unity is all about without having to make anything of your own to start. Yep. And really, the best way to explain this is actually just to show it. So Thomas, would you like to steal? You have stolen. I Yay! I would love to steal the screen. Uh, <laughs> I do have chat up as well. So if you have questions, throw them at us. But micro games are super powerful, right? Because we've built these experiences that you can go in and modify and edit and change to get a feel for how things work. So this is the Unity Hub. So if you've installed Unity, this will be your starting point for every project where you can manage all of your Unity installs. And I need to make sure that my latest install, okay, cool. It is still installed, good. I clicked <laughs> uninstall accidentally yesterday while I was on a call with Joy and then I hit cancel and it looks like it did not uninstall it. So we're good. Um, <laughs> So what we can do here, yours might be empty. It might have a couple projects. You can see that uh, Unity keeps me hard at work, so I have to make a lot of projects. But what we'll do is we'll click New Project right here. And this is going to take us to all of our templates, right? We have this list of templates. And where you're looking for the carding micro game. I already have mine installed. If yours isn't installed, you're going to scroll down this list till you find it and click on the little cloud icon to download it. Once it's downloaded, you'll select the template. You'll name it what you want. I'm going to call mine Carding Micro Game BSIS, so I know what this is for. And if you want, you can put this in a special location on your hard drive. As you can see, I keep all of mine in a folder called Unity Projects. Um, then I'm going to go ahead and create the project, and we'll let this boot up into the micro game really quick. So this is going to take a little bit of time because once you see the project itself, it's it's chock full of stuff. There's effectively a yeah. fully working game. So as soon as this opens up, Thomas can literally hit the play button and play a racing game. Yeah. Uh, and that's something that's really fantastic because if you've ever tried to learn a new piece of software, you've probably been hit with the phenomenon of uh, blank page fear where you open yeah. up this brand new piece of software. It's massive. There's nothing on the screen. You don't know what to do. You don't know when to start. This makes it easy. There's a button that you immediately know you want to press. That's the play button. So you can go and play the game and immediately get a feel for what Unity is all about. And that's what we really want. We don't want anybody to be afraid of Unity. There's no reason to. We're soft and we're friendly and we're fuzzy. I do want to add a note, though. Every time I start a brand new project, I still have that fear, even though it's been like six years. <laughs> like I'm working on a project right now. And when I first started it on Monday, I opened it and there was just the empty scene. And I was just like, It'll where do okay. I start? <laughs> and then I had to like write down some notes of where to start. And then I jumped in. So that's so, a normal feeling. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely something that you um, are always going to encounter to some degree, but I, I have a hot tip I think might help you, Thomas. <gasps> What's the that? Jurassic Park theme. So as this is loading up. Da, 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 <laughs> da, 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 but what if da. there's Tyrannosaurus? But there's Brontosauruses first, and they're okay. Cute. You're right, and they're way friendlier than Tyrannosaurus. All right, we're good. Yes. We're good. All right, so this is done loading for me, and I'll just show you really quickly, and then uh, 
we'll have Joy pull up the steps and let you all kind of follow along. But mm -hmm. once it loads, you're going to get this nice little getting started with Unity. And I'm going to tell it to load the scene, not the tutorials. Now, you can use these tutorials, and I would highly recommend going through them. We're just not going to touch them today because we're going to do our own set of tutorials. But this is another cool thing is we give you a whole series of tutorials that will teach you stuff right in the engine. But I'm going to click load scene. And then when I hit play, I don't know if I'm sharing my game audio or not. So you might hear game audio. I definitely hear it. Do you hear any you music, don't. Joy? No, but okay. you know what? Then I'm going to mute it. Yeah. But now I have this playable game. It might look a little choppy for you because I found streaming gameplay over Zoom is not the most effective way to share it. Yeah, but, but this does run quite smoothly if you're doing it on your yeah. own computer. This is unfortunately just a limitation of Zoom. So, yep. But um, I'm just showing you I can play and I'm going to go ahead and unpause it now. Tokyo Drifting. Um, Thomas is mm -hmm. an extra, expert driver. It looked choppy because of Zoom, not because of his driving. Yeah. I mean, so my look, when I drive in the real city, it's very choppy. It's kind of strange. Yeah. I don't understand. It looks how exactly I like that. <laughs> All right. Well, let me steal back the screen and kind of it, reiterate what Thomas just went through here. So let me da da and da da and da da. There we go. So, what Thomas just went through and did is he created a new project. He renamed the project. You don't have to, but if you're going to start creating a lot of Unity projects, it's advisable so you know it, which project is which. Yep. Uh, and he selected the location for it. Uh, he chose the carding micro game and clicked download template and then just clicked create project and it loaded up. And then he was immediately able to go and press play. So, we will give half a second uh, for people who are following along in real time. Um, and while we're just waiting here, I wanted to just touch on those um, in editor tutorials again. Unity has a plethora of ways of learning how to use the engine. Um, there's Unity Learn where I live and I put my content, but there's also these in editor tutorials, which is really great because when you're first getting started in Unity, it's Kind of challenging to be bouncing all over the place so being yeah. able to stay within the unity editor just hit a button that says okay i want to learn this part next and unity will actually guide you through it they'll actually just say hey do this step and it'll detect when that step is done so really you just need to focus right on one thing and that's it so that's really nice um and hopefully a, a comfortable way of proceeding throughout uh learning unity so i'm just checking chat right here um so how much time do we want to give uh this thomas do we want to uh, like two more minutes maybe <laughs> and uh as a reminder if you have any questions at all um the chat is open both uh thomas and i are monitoring it so mm -hmm. we could answer any questions uh if you run in, uh, into any challenges if you're following along with us um but yeah otherwise yeah, yeah. it's just cruising and i and then we'll jump in and show you kind of how to add some objects to the scene, how to move around them. We'll talk about what scenes are, which is mm -hmm. kind of exciting. Look, and it's like a lot of folks in the chat played a ton of games made with Unity. There's a game called Killer Bean. I have not played Killer Bean. I wonder if it's on the App Store. My phone's not in the room, but I'm going to go look. Yeah, I am not I familiar. But uh, odds are pretty good if it's a mobile game. It is a Unity game. We own 60% of the market. Mobile game developers yeah. love Unity because we're fast and easy as far as getting things up. And I just saw a question come through. What do you think is the most important skill for a sex, uh, successful 3D designer? Ooh, that's a big question. Um, <laughs> thanks, Thomas. You're welcome. You're welcome. No, I, I think really, though, it's <sighs> curiosity. Uh, and a willingness to pick up uh, any new piece of tech just to try it. Um, I think one of the greatest strengths that I happened across uh, when I was specifically in the 3D art side of things is if there was something that I read about online, I went and got the free trial and I tried it. Like even if I didn't yeah. like it, even if it was confusing, I just tried everything I could. And once right. again, going back to the whole like, uh, like chef in the kitchen thing, right? That's something that you have to do with any skill where if it's relevant to what you want to do, you've got to go and try it. So if you're a chef, you've got to taste all the ingredients and put them together um, and constantly make things. Even if it's just tiny little things, even if it isn't ultimately successful, trying to make stuff as often as possible is very important. Yeah. I think that curiosity is massive. That and just, you know, having a positive outlook and being a team player. Mm -hmm. There's real-time 3D changes very 
very fast. It's not, it is not a slow moving technology. There is new things introduced every month. Yes. And so being willing to just explore stuff is massive and also comfortable. And just sometimes knowing you're not going to know everything. I literally, Assuming you're not going to know everything. Yeah, I literally come into contact with stuff I don't understand every day. Mm-hmm. It's not like weekly. It's not monthly. It's daily that I'm just like, I have never heard of that before. I guess I'm going to have to go research it. Right. Like I think the last conversation Joanna had, she was talking about voxel modeling yeah. and I'm like, I've never done anything with voxels before. And honestly, I don't know what that word means. So I spent two hours reading about voxels. Like it's just how the technology is because there's so many ways to solve all these different problems. Everybody knows different stuff. And that's what's so fun about it for me because it's always new. It's always fresh. It's always exciting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's an important perception thing too. If you're constantly thinking to yourself like, oh, I'm never going to know everything. Eh, That's a bad thing you're going to have a really rough time. You you really need to think about the fact that, oh, there's never going to be like, we're never going to run out of stuff, right? You're never exactly. going to reach the end of the book and have nothing more. Like every day, like you said, Thomas, there's something new to learn. Uh, and, you know, if you really embrace that spirit of uh, learning every day, then it, it's a lot of fun. It's just new stuff to learn, not uh, there's yep. new stuff to learn. Exactly. So All right, should we what jump do we think? forward and play? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's uh, just do a quick preview of what you were going to be doing next, which is yeah. learning all about scenes. So this is going to be the next step. Thomas is going to go through and talk you through it actually within the Unity editor. So steal it away, sir. Perfect. Let me hit this button. And uh, Joy, I'm sure we'll have a lot to add because she knows a ton. Yeah. Um, so this is our scene view of the Unity editor. So this is kind of our window into the 3D world we're creating, right? This is how we see what's going on. And on the left here, we have our hierarchy. And the hierarchy contains everything that is in our scene. If it lives in this list right here, that means it lives in the world we're building. And if we look at this dropdown, oh, good, yeah. I was gonna say, a good way to think about this is it's a table of contents for the scene. Mm, So yeah, it's just a nice list and like a table of contents, well, digital. Wow, th- this allegory doesn't work for traditional books, but I was going to say like a table of contents, if you click on the thing, it'll go to the actual object. Yeah. So for digital books, that works. For physical, not so much, but that's okay. So you see my scene right here. If I expand this out, everything opens up. So the scene is a container for my world. And so the one way I like to think about it is when you're playing a game, right? And maybe you finish a level and then you go to a loading screen and the next level opens. That's most likely, you're probably moving from one scene to another scene, right? You're stepping forward to a new scene. And that's a really good way to containerize your game is you can have scene upon scene upon scene. And it also helps you compartmentalize. So we're going to just kind of look at some stuff. So I'm going to double click on my cart and that frames up our little racer. And I can hold alt and left click and I can kind of pivot around to get a nice little view here. But if I also want to like move around um, my racer, I can also use the middle mouse wheel to zoom in and out of things. And if I hold right click, I can actually fly through the scene using WASD, just like I'm playing, you know, a first person shooter or another PC game and kind of explore my world to see what I've created. Whoops, I'm below the level. So back face calling is happening. Mm-hmm. Here we go. I don't know why I hit space bar, but let's do that. I want, I'm trying to jump but I can kind of fly around and look at my world. If I want to focus on something, like maybe I'm like, what is this tree? I can click on it and hover my mouse and push F and it'll snap my view to kind of look at this tree. And then I can pivot around it again, holding Alt and left clicking. Um, And yeah, that's kind of the main ways we can navigate inside of real time 3D. And so now what we're going to let you do is kind of explore and experiment with that for a second, just kind of move around the scene. And then we'll jump on actually adding some objects to the scene. Yep, yep. Let me go ahead and steal back here for a second. Every moment I do this is like, am I going to select the right screen? Right. It's like, (gasps) so let's go ahead and reveal these moving around since this is where we are. Do, 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 do. And I'm actually going to paste this link in the chat for everybody as well. So this is a cheat sheet that I think, did Veronica build this? Uh, Either Veronica or Ross. Yeah. But this is a cheat sheet right here that actually has this image 
just as like a nice little PDF you can download so you can keep it around. You can print it and hang it on your wall. You can just have it digitally. You can frame it and you mm-hmm. can put it on your desk next to the pictures of your family, like whatever you want to do with it. It's there for you. You could yeah. use it as much as you want. <laughs> um, and as you're playing around with this, I think this is a really important part of the experience of first moving into 3D. And I want to share yeah. my challenges with this when we first started, uh, when I first started learning about 3D. My actual first 3D tool was not Unity, but a program called Autodesk Maya. And this was a mm. piece of software that is used in the film industry, in games, uh, basically anywhere where you need highly detailed models. And this was quite a long time ago. This was a uh, 2005. So um, I had never touched any piece of 3D software before. And um, I personally struggled a lot with this because it was such a fundamentally different way of looking at things. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because Maya's control scheme is exactly the same as Unity's. So um, I feel like I share this experience with anybody that struggles with 3D. Um, Because if you think about what you're doing, you are moving around in 3D space on a 2D object, right? Because you're looking at a monitor, that's 2D. So if you feel like this is um, a challenge for you, that's not weird. That's not bad. That's completely normal. That's normal. Because you're your brain is jumping through dimensions, essentially. (laughs) So if you feel like this is really hard and it's taking you a long time to get a hang of, don't worry about it. It's completely normal. Uh, Eventually there'll become a a point with enough practice that you just start to get it and you'll find yourself moving faster and faster and faster. But if you need to have this sheet in front of you while you're using Unity for a while, that's fine. Like there, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, This is, Fundamentally, fundamentally different from anything else you would have done before if you've never used 3D software before. Exactly. And, you know, I I had a similar journey. Somebody mentioned like what made you, somebody asked what made you want to pursue a career in this? Mm -hmm. And for me, it was, I was actually working at a company and I was, so my, I went to school for audio production. I was going to be a musician. Um, I like guitar and metal quite a bit. (laughs) Yeah. I just love the breakdowns, Mm -hmm. love a good Jun Jun. Um, But, you know, I was helping people make content And it was so exciting to see what they were making. Like I got so excited watching these videos that it made me be like, this is what I want to do. And I started watching those courses and learning from them. And for me, it was actually super interesting as well because I I made the transition from 2D to 3D. I was very used to working with Adobe Premiere, Mm -hmm. Adobe Photoshop, and Adobe Audition, right? Everything was flat and it was all Xs and Ys. And suddenly this extra dimension got added. So it actually took me probably two months to get really comfortable moving around inside the editor in 3d to get that Mm -hmm. z dimension in my brain mapped Mm -hmm. so it's so challenging and you think too it's like well we exist in a 3d world how could this be hard but it's not just that we exist Mm -hmm. here it's that we're going through that translation of the 2d it's 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 really hard it's genuinely hard uh but once you get past that how like i feel like you'll you'll be much more comfortable with all the things that come next so uh as for like why i got into 3d i it's interesting too because like thomas i didn't start with like oh i want to be a game designer and this is it i actually started as a costume designer and i thought about this a lot and i think ultimately what this comes (laughs) down to is i want to tell stories and um through costume design i was thinking of like a you know a career in film where what is it but stories but once i got to school and all of my friends were in the game design program i realized wow this is a piece of media uh that is it's more than film because it's not just you're passively watching something you're interacting with the story and that's just i don't know i think it's the coolest thing ever so i like bringing people into the story so that's why i got here yeah, no, I think it's a great way and a great opportunity for me to to move the story forward by stealing the screen. Da, 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 segways. <laughs> so one thing I forgot to do is we have this tutorial list here. Because we're not going to the tutorials, if you right click on this little tab, um, I can go ahead and hit close tab and that'll just give me more space to work. If you ever want to bring that back, you can just go to tutorials, show tutorials. But for now, we're getting rid of those and we're just doing our tutorials. Yep, yep. And so we're going to add an object to the scene now. We're going to start customizing this game, right? 
Mm -hmm. And so if we navigate to the, our assets, so this is our project window, which is where all of our files that we have access to are shared. So we're going to go look inside of carting. And I've got to remember from yesterday where this goes. I'm going to jump into the prefabs folder. Yep, yep. Uh, prefabs are basically pre-created and pre-configured objects that we can reuse. And it makes making experiences a lot easier um, to have these. So we've provided some for you. And we're going to look at, I want to play with some environment pieces. So we have all these different environment pieces. I was really hoping to do an arch. Oh, I know. think that's in the other folder. Is that, okay, is it in the- uh, In the, the props. props. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. We got a checkpoint, a crash object. You know what? We're doing the a bowling pin. That's okay. Bowling pin, Whee! So fun story about bowling pins. Where I live in Utah, there was this bowling alley called the Ritz. And in front of it, they have a 70 foot tall bowling pin that's been oh. there since like the twenties. It's now an apartment complex, but the bowling pin lives. Wow. If you want to see a giant bowling pin, you can drive down state street, I guess. Anyway, so I'm going to left click this and I can either drag it right into my hierarchy or I can pull it through my scene and just kind of pick where to stick it. So I'm going to take it and we'll put it like right in the middle of the street. Then I'll hover and hit F to kind of frame up. And it's there. And it's there. And now I can edit. Let me see if that's the next step though. It is not. Okay. So we're going to add some little fun stuff. This is called the transform and the transform stores position, rotation, and scale. And I just told you this really great story about a giant bowling pin. And so I feel like I would be robbing all of you if I didn't make a giant bowling pin. So I'm going to yeah. zoom back a little bit. How could we visualize your story without like actual visuals? Exactly. So I'm going to push R or I'm going to click on this button right here, which is the scale tool. Oh, that's the move tool. Where's my scale tool? There you are. Boop. Wait a minute. Is R not the button anymore? It is, but you. Okay. Yeah. I think you had something and selected. <laughs> and I'm going to left click and just drag. And we're just going to make this thing huge. We're making like so a So it's like this that big? It's like that big. It's huge. Wow. So we'll pull back and then I'll hit W to select my move tool. And you see how I get these arrows? So now I can move on these axes. So I'm going to move it up and to the left so it's off the road. Because if our car hits this giant bowling pin, I don't think it'll survive. I don't feel and like you're going to be able to get like a strike by, uh, by hitting that yeah. pin. Mm -mm. Nope. Nope. So I'm just going to do that and have this nice giant bowling pin added to the scene. And now all of y'all can do the same thing. You can pick a bowling pin. There's a ramp. There's a bouncy ball. There's a bunch of stuff. You can either look in the environment or the props folder, but uh, we'll pull those steps up for you and let you all dive in. And we'll give you like four minutes to play around before we jump to the next step. Yep, yep. So let me steal back. Stealing, stealing. Here we go. Let's go ahead and add a 3D prop. There we go. So once again, a uh, cool thing about these templates is that it isn't limited to just what you see in the scene that you open up. Uh, we provide a bunch of extra stuff so you could really customize this and create something that's truly your own. And that's without having to do anything extra aside right. from just exploring the folders, which is really cool. And while we're at it, I think I saw another question come through. Uh, what would you consider your best accomplishment as a 3D designer, Thomas? It's a tough question. Um, honestly, I think right now it's giving workshops like this um, because I love sharing knowledge and I love seeing people get excited by tech. And mm -hmm. so it's more exciting for me to like hang out and do this kind of stuff and see what you all end up creating from it. Like those are my biggest accomplishments. Like when somebody tags me on LinkedIn and they're like, I just got this certification or look at this game I just released. That's what that those are my accomplishments to me because it's like, hey, I showed this person this thing and now they've made a game. Mm -hmm. um, so I think like probably currently my greatest accomplishment is right this second, like hanging out with all y'all. <laughs> so awesome. yeah. I think for me, uh, it, it's really just releasing stuff on Unity Learn. Uh, if I had had to isolate it down to one specific se uh, section, I would say the pathways on Unity Learn, which are our full Super experience great. from start to finish, learning how to do a thing in Unity. Um, and like you, I, I feel like there's just so much value in being able to see what other people are able to do once they're empowered to build things with Unity. Um, you know, it's fun to build stuff in Unity for sure. Like that, I, I do stuff on my own all the time in Unity, but 
it's so much more fun and more rewarding to see what other people are doing. Because again, like I want to see other people's stories. I want to see other people's creations. And if we can help them in some way to get there, I mean, how can, what could be cooler than that? Right. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, and I think too, like with this tech, we talk about how like the future is so is moving so fast, right? Mm-hmm. It's everybody, like it's all of you that are going to drive this tech forward. Like Joy and I come up with some pretty cool stuff, right? But it's, you know, it's it's the college kids that are coming out that are going to build wild stuff that's going to change my job completely in five years. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I get really excited about that because I think it's cool. Yeah, I, and it's really exciting and incredible to think about that. But that's kind of how humanity works, right? Is that, you know, when we were first coming into this, we were thinking about unity in different ways. And so we're presenting our ideas. And then the next generation of learners is going to take what we had thought about differently and think about it even more differently. And it's just going to become this unknowable thing for us right now that's going to feel so natural to you guys. And it's just, it's really neat to see how what we thought as cutting edge becomes the standard. And then the next cutting edge thing comes out and then we get to say woo all over again. Exactly. Okay. With that, I'm going to steal the screen back and we're going to go to the the next step. So we've added an object that other folks created, right? Like I didn't make this bowling pin. We probably had an artist make it for us. Now we've got it here, which is a very common part of industry, but let's make our own object. Let's make a ball that our car can push around. Because that sounds kind of fun. So you can create primitives in Unity. So primitives in the world of 3D are primitive shapes, right? So if I was thinking of 2D primitive shapes, right? Triangle, square, rectangle, circle, mm-hmm. uh, that type of stuff, right? Well, those in were all 3D, the shapes. <laughs> those, were the, those were them. Those were the shapes. Yep. Also, did you know I, I actually didn't know what the primary colors were this week? Because <laughs> in my mind, from being a programmer, RGB oh, are no. the primary RGB. colors. <laughs> And so my wife was like, yeah, what are the primary colors? And I was like, yeah, RGB. And she was like. There are elementary it. school students all over the world that are like shaking their head right now. I, There's a grown up that doesn't know the primary colors. Yes, his name is Thomas. Literally, she had to explain it to me. Anyway, total side story. So, but we have these primitives in 3D. So we have spheres, we have pyramids. We have rectangles or cubes, I guess, and then you can make them into rectangles. We have capsules, uh, and then we have, what are the flat capsules? Cylinders? Cylinders. (laughs) You (laughs) broke my brain. (laughs) Those are the squishy capsules because they're top, they're flat. Mm -hmm. Um, So we have those, and we can use them to like create environments, create basic shapes. And so we're going to create a ball that we can push around. So there's two ways to create. You can hit plus in the hierarchy, and then you can go down to 3D object and select sphere, or you can go to your assets folder and you can right click and go to create and then select 3D object. Wait, did we move 3D object out of here? You could do it from the drop down where it says game object. Why did we move that on me? Where's the game object drop down? Joy, up, where did it? Up, 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 at the top of the editor, up, 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 up. out of that folder. <laughs> leave that folder space. No, leave. What, what? Go to the top of the editor. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you can't right click anyway. It doesn't matter. All right. So we're going to put a game object and we can create a 3D <laughs> object here and we can create a sphere. So I'm going to do that. And it's going to snap this sphere right here uh, in kind of the center of our view. And I want to put this sphere kind of in front of my car. So using the move tool, which is W, I'm just going to kind of scoot it around. And this is where 3D can be fun, but tricky. So if I look at it like this, it looks like the sphere is on the ground, right? But then if we actually kind of float around, we realize it's off the ground. So that's where, for me, first learning 3D, that's where things got tricky. So I'm just going to kind of scoot it around and frame it up so that I can see that, okay, it's actually on the ground right here. And then I want to make it a little bit bigger. So I'm going to manually change the scale to like 222. Just give us a little bit bigger of a ball. Kind of like a beach ball thing. Mm -hmm, Like a party ball. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, we're going to test the sphere. So when I hit play, the sphere should just sit there right now because we haven't done anything special. It does have a collider, so we're not going to be able to drive through it. So it's being blocked. It's just a big obstacle. Uh. 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 Okay. So we'll let y'all get to this point and then we'll jump forward and make it so that the sphere can actually be interacted with, with the car. Yep. 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 
Stealing. Also, this has got to be. I need to learn how to make my highlight color pink instead of blue. That is super sick. I'm looking at the screenshot like I need to go change some of my unity preferences. Mm -hmm. um, ooh, does your major matter when looking to start a career in real time 3D? That um, is a good one. What do you think, Joy? What do you think? So I don't think so. And here's why. I have yet to come up with an idea for a major that would not benefit from real time 3D in some way. Because basically, what real time 3D does is it allows you to uh, think about your areas of study in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for a while I was thinking, oh, well, I suppose like, uh, a literary major might not make use of real time 3D, but no, what if they want to visualize what a story would look like? What, yep. how does poetry look in 3D space? There's and an opportunity for that. I actually met with um, Notre Dame about a month ago and their literary department uses VR. Um, so they actually make them deal with the moral quandary of Romeo and Juliet, but you're not Romeo and Juliet. You're the potion maker that sells the poison. It's really Ooh. interesting. So like, it's definitely available. That's fascinating. So yeah, I think really it real time 3D is something that uh, can only help your area of focus. Uh, and yeah. if you ever want to change careers in real time 3D, it's interesting too, because it's kind of like, it's this central hub, right? So if you are a scientist that knows real time 3D and you want to move into film, well, you still know real time 3D, which is another thing that you know makes use uh, well, uses real-time 3D. So uh, you just shift the way that you're focusing on it. So it's just a extra bit yep. of knowledge that helps you out. Now, I will say that while your college, well, and college is still important. I don't want to say it's not, but while your college degree may not impact whether or not you can get into real-time 3D, I do think your portfolio will. So yes. you need to have, if you're going to get into it, as you're working through things on learn, you should definitely have a list of things you have built. Like somebody asked, hey, is there an entry-level position for an extended reality developer at Unity? Not that I know of right now, but we do hire XR developers. And the mm -hmm. thing they're going to want to see is what games have you published? What apps have you created? What XR experiences have you built? So for me as a programmer, my portfolio is on GitHub. All of the code I've written when I build a project, I upload it to GitHub so that I can say, oh, I did this and oh, I did this, right? And as an artist, you should have something on like ArtStation or DeviantArt or itch.io, right? You should be mm -hmm. making sure to curate those experiences so you can show the work you've created. Mm -hmm. And here's an interesting one that just popped up. What if your basis in 3D is in additive manufacturing? Can you branch into gaming and maybe in Unity? Oh, Tell us you were just showing me something. I literally am building day. a project right <laughs> now. Um, so we call that, the term right now is digital twin. So if you're working in like additive manufacturing, any kind of manufacturing, manufacturing uses us a lot. So as an example, say you build a rocket and you're like, cool, this is the rocket. This is my design. I know it'll work. It meets all the standards. And then your boss is like, well, what's it going to look like in the sky? Well, you can do two things. You can A, build the rocket and put it in the sky, which is going to cost a ton of money. Or you can convert the model, put it in Unity, build a sky simulation and have the rocket in the sky and show them what it's going to look like in the sky. Yeah, and these um, companies love topic. this because it, it saves a lot of money for them as well. Because if you think about, I think um, auto manufacturers are a great example of this because it used to be that when an auto, auto manufacturer was going to create a brand new car, they would make it life-size in clay. And some companies still do that, but a lot of them actually use real-time 3D software. A lot of them actually use Unity to create those visualizations of what their cars will look like. And they're not spending money on tons of clay um, if they want to make changes, those changes can be instant. So it saves, uh, you know, money, it saves time. And you could even add things like putting it in VR so people could literally physically walk around it, look into it, all of it. And it, yeah, there we go. Thomas's example here. Yeah. This is exactly what can be done in Unity. So this is an example of a project I'm working on. So here's the rocket. It breaks apart. It's in the sky. So we can see how the lighting reflects off it and how it's going to look. Uh, I just want to kind of show you all that kind of idea of like, this is a digital twin of a rocket that we can now demonstrate and say, look, like this is what it'll look like in performance. I haven't added fire. I don't think this turbine actually shoots fire. I think it's a wind turbine, but you know what? <laughs> I like fire. It's cool. So it's good. Fire's good. Keeps us warm. Um, so jumping forward, 
we can jump into now we want to make the sphere interact with the physics system. So physics is important and Unity has a really cool setup with physics and we use what are called rigid bodies. And so what a rigid body essentially does is tells Unity's physics system, I'm here, like I exist. You put a rigid body on something and you're saying, hey, this thing needs physical interactions in the world. And so if that's going to be the case, we want to do that. So I've got our sphere selected. And on the right, we have our inspector. This shows every component attached to the sphere. I'm just going to hit add component and I'm going to search for a rigid body. Now there's two rigid body types. There's a 2D and then there's a plain rigid body. We want to make sure we put the plain rigid body because that's a 3D one. If we do the 2D one, it'll only interact with the two-dimensional physics system, which we're not using. So I'm going to add this rigid body. And I'm not going to make any changes to it right now. I'm just going to leave it default. Actually, let's turn the mass down. Let's make it way like be less massy. We'll make it half, 0.5. Um, and you can experiment with this um, when you're playing around. But now when I run into the ball, it's going to have a physical interaction. It's going to calculate that transfer of energy uh, when I can drive. Whoa. <laughs> but why am I? They're all falling over. Oh, they also so, have physics on them. They do. Okay, so go. now I can chase this ball and I can start knocking it around the track. Why are they taking off? And now I can knock it they, off the track. They're sphere colliders. They they have big colliders. So when you went by, you hit it and it went boom. I think that's exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's wild. So we might want to, you know, if we were going to make our game different, we might want to change that. Let's go look at how big the collider. Oh my goodness. See. <laughs> yep. Look at that. It's got a big old, big old series of colliders on it. But. Now we've made our sphere so we can knock it around. We can interact with it, right? And that sphere has it. Um, so we'll let you all go ahead and do that for a second. And then I say what? Say what? Huh? I said, do, 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 do. Oh, okay. I, did, I thought you were my, like, that's my, no, no, no. That's my, <laughs> that's my screen stealing song. <laughs> gotcha. 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 I, I like your, your screen stealing song. Stealing um, let's see. Screen. Oh, man. Cool. And then you guys. got. Yeah, so what we're making is a cheap clone of Rocket League or <laughs> soccer car. Good um, old soccer car. Yeah. Um, and then we've got two more steps after this. Hopefully nobody's in a massive hurry. I don't mind going a few minutes over to finish this. It's only like another five or so minutes. Mm -hmm. We can answer final questions and then let you all go enjoy. I mean, I know there's some folks in Ghana, so it's probably like, what, like 8 p.m. or so? Almost 8 p.m.? You're about seven, eight hours ahead of me, I think, so... Oh, even more spectacular that you guys are joining because it's not just a Saturday, it's a Saturday evening. I know. It's, uh, ah. After 7 p.m. for me, that's when I get beer. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. it's uh, I, I definitely will be playing uh, uh, D and D at that time here. Saturday is game night. Saturday is game night. Yep, yep. All right, so you can go ahead and select your sphere, add a rigid body. And then change that mass value. Remember, the higher the mass, the harder it is to move it. Um, and then ram it with your car in play mode and see what happens. Okay, almost 3 p.m. for Diana. Okay, cool. Nice. Oh, that makes sense. You're on the East Coast. Okay, cool, cool. Wow, this is truly like a global call. <laughs> right, this is awesome. This makes me excited. Yep. West Coast, Middle Coast, East Coast, coast. more Coast. Eastern Hemisphere. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. right. We're multi-hemisphering, yeah. aren't we? Yeah, we are. All right, so we'll let that kind of roll around. And let's see what we got. We'll get one more minute to play with this. I don't see any other questions popping up right now. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, this is this is where the stuff gets fun, right? Building those interactions is where this gets really exciting because then you can start having some really fun physics interactions. I'm trying and to I think of like it. fun physics games I've liked. Like pinball games are always super fun, but like heavy physics games are really interesting. Yeah, I'm trying to think of, uh, you know, like, I've built so many Pachinko games for workshop like these, so yeah, that's always yep. my thought. So this goat Simulator, I guess oh, Goat yeah, Simulator yeah, was super one. fun. Mm -hmm. It's like launching ragdoll goats into the sky. Nothing better than just throwing animals around or having mm -hmm, animals mm -hmm. throw other people around with the tongue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and All the right. cool thing about this too, as Thomas gets back into it, is... I want to point out the fact that we're making all of these drastic changes to the game without writing any code. 
Uh, there's yeah. often a perception in Unity where you can only make stuff happen with programming, and that's simply not true. That's not why true. it's so great for uh, non-programmers and artists or people just dabbling. You could build really interactive, incredible, drastically different things by just experimenting around with what's in the editor itself. Yep, exactly. And uh, there was a really good question about how do you handle criticisms of your design, which oh, I could do a whole workshop on that. We should talk about that. Oh, um, but first, let's change the color of the ball. So Ooh, let's do it. With, with real time 3D or any like 3D application, we use what are called materials. And materials assign the color, uh, the metallicity, or how reflective it is, uh, all of those types of properties, and really just how this interacts with light and color. So inside of assets, I'm going to right click. I'm going to create a folder first, and I'm going to name it materials because you should always organize your stuff early. Uh, if you don't, your project will become very unwieldy. Then I'm going to open the materials folder, right click, go to create, and I'm going to choose material. And I'm going to name this all material. Make it something easy. So right now we have all of these inputs for the colors, right? And right now it's just a default white, which I don't like. Um, I actually want to make it my favorite color, which is pink. Yay. So we'll go here and we'll drag that right Whoa. here. And now I want the ball to be shinier. So I'm going to turn up the metallic map and make it really me metallic. Mm. And then also I'm going to crank up the smoothness so that it's super smooth, right? So think of like a shiny, like a shiny chrome ball, which I happen to have sitting right here. This is nice. very smooth. So it directly reflects things. And so that's what I'm doing is I'm making this super smooth so that it reflects the sun and gives this nice kind of like, almost like a, what are they called? Push the buttons on the side, pull the lever. Oh, uh, pinball? Pinball, thank you. My goodness, my brain just <laughs> dropped that one. So like, almost like a pinball, like a nice pink purple pinball. So we'll do that. And then the cool thing is we'll hit play again and we can drive and ram this. And now we've got this beautiful purple ball reflecting the sky that we yeah. can now knock around the environment. And you may have noticed as uh, Thomas was going and driving around that we're actually getting reflections from the sun. We get those, yep. like, look at that pretty little point right there. That's just done for you. Unity yep. is ca calculating light for you, making that reflectivity happen for you. And all you had to do was to find the material as I want this really metallic and really shiny. And then Unity took care of the rest. Yep. All right. If you want to steal back the screen, we'll hang out for like a minute or two and let you all make a material, slap it on the ball. And then we're going to make a different kind of material called a physics material. And um, we'll show you kind of what that does. Um, and then we'll kind of wrap. But while we're doing that, so how do you handle criticism when it comes to your design? So I'll start just because I have this framework I like to use. So first of all, I accept all criticism. And the first thing I do, though, when someone gives me criticism is I analyze where it's coming from. So if someone is like, hey, uh, this is your, I'm criticizing your Captain America drawing. My first thing is, is this person an artist? What is their background? And what is their intent with the criticism? Mm -hmm. Then I look at the criticism and I say, okay, cool. Does it apply to my outcome? If they're like, well, we don't want your Captain America to be so muscly. And my goal was to draw a really muscly Captain America. I can't accept that criticism, right? Because it doesn't work for what I'm doing. That being said, if it does improve it, then I accept it, right? But I try to not take it personally. Mm -hmm. um, another thing is there's a really good talk from GDC on the creating of Doom 2016, mm -hmm. where they talk about how they did their playtesting. And they weren't doing the playtesting to see if the players have fun. They were doing playtesting to see if the players played the game in the way they intended them to. Mm -hmm. And that's how they tuned their experience. And that's how they use the feedback. Um, and it's super interesting. I'll see if I can find it. But that's how I do criticism is I generally try to assume it's coming from a place of helpfulness. And if it's not, then I pretty much just ignore it. Like if they're being just being mean to be mean, I just ignore it. Yeah, I think that's kind of the critical part, because as artists, it's so hard to separate yourselves from your work um, or even programmers, too. I think that it's very much the same story. Um, you feel very attached to what you create. And for me, I think it's really important to sit down and really study that intention and really study what is being said. If somebody just walks up to you and says, your stuff sucks, disregard that. That's not, not helpful. Yeah. But if somebody comes to you and says, hey, you have this problem with, let's say you're an artist and say, hey, your anatomy is wrong here. That 
is them trying to help you improve your work. So you can start exploring that more. And rather than thinking like, oh, I suck as an artist, think of it as, a, oh, this is an opportunity to learn how to improve my stuff. How is the anatomy wrong? Can you show me? And start asking questions and try and dig out um, kind of what they're telling you. Try and learn more. Take that as a learning opportunity. And if you shift your perception from, oh, they're being critical of my work to, oh, I can now learn something from this person, then I think it really helps change the narrative. Exactly. And just like that, let's change our narrative and go to our final step of creating a Bouncy. physics material. So inside my materials folder, we'll leave it in here. I'm going to right click and I'm going to create, but this time I'm going to create a physic material. So let's just scroll down until we find that. There it is right there below signal. Mm -hmm. We're going to create a physic material and we're going to name it Bouncy. Bouncy. So Right now, the ball is kind of just generally reacting. It's just kind of like this is the normal amount of bounciness, and I am using that normal amount of bounciness. So we're going to make this 100% bouncy with a one. I'm also going to turn the friction to zero just because I've never done that in a demo before, and I want to see what's going to happen. I assume without friction, it's going to be chaos, but we'll find out. So then I'll select the ball, and if you look on my rigid body, we have this slot. It's Where's your my... slider. <laughs> Ah, uh, it's on my collider. There's my material slot right there. So this is a physics material slot. So we're going to drag it right there. And we've got bouncy in there now. So now let's see what happens. No friction, max bounce. Chaos? I hope so. <laughs> They're just flying everywhere. I love it. Like, all right. So we're going to drive. Boom. Ooh. So now look, it's bouncier. It bounces off the walls more. It's sliding. Look how it keeps going too. Like it's definitely not being mm -hmm. slowed down at all because there's no friction to slow it down. <laughs> it's oh, going no. to go forever. Yeah, it's going forever because that energy is not being transferred into anything. Now I you gotta know. catch up with it. <laughs> it's gonna catch my super bouncy ball. Uh, uh. Whoa, oh, now no. it's gonna go off into the sunset forever. So goodbye. Now we've changed how bouncy it is, right? And so we can have fun kind of manipulating those values and changing the way the world is going to interact to kind of change a couple of things and see how it goes. So with that. We'll let Joy still back the steps and we'll let y'all do that last step of just making this crazy bouncy. And you can play with those values. You can make it maybe half bouncy. Um, I'm pretty sure you can't go below one, above one, right? Because it's a scale of yeah. zero to a hundred. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of times in real-time figure and software in general, when we're doing a scale of 100, we, a lot of times we'll just simplify it to a zero to 100 scale, right? So 0. 0.6 would be 60% or 60 out of 100. One is 100 out of 100. It just makes numbers easier and math easier. We like floats, which mm -hmm. is decimal points. And if you're, if you, if you know anything about software developers, we're all about making numbers easier. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and don't so throw me no 10. That's too many numbers. Base eight, get out of here. But Wait, you want me to divide one. by six? No. I can't do math. No, we, I didn't go into programming to learn math. I, I went into programming so math could be done for me. I mean, that's it's funny too. Um, there's this perception that you have to be like really good at math to be a programmer. And knowing math is definitely valuable, but uh, you don't have to be a mathematician in order to program. Um, Correct. I am terrible at math. Uh, my sister actually is the math person in the family. She has a PhD in advanced mathematics and I failed geometry. <laughs> So, but I can still program is the thing. And, and that's, and you yeah. work with geometry a lot more than she does, I would argue, because that's which what is funny. Is. Yeah, yeah, which is hilarious about it. And it's just because that right there, I think really speaks to um, our brains thinking in different ways. Like I struggled with geometry on pieces of paper and like right. doing all the calculating stuff. But once you put me in 3D space, I could do that all day. So it's just a matter of mm -hmm. approaching your strengths and, you know, doing things in the ways that make the most sense for you. Exactly. All right, we're going to do one more minute of letting you all play test with the bouncy ball. Remember, like if you've fallen behind at all during this workshop, I did see the message that it was being recorded, mm -hmm. which leads me to believe that Jude and crew were going to share this out on your discords and stuff. Um, if they need us to say you have permission to do that, you totally do. Please share it with everybody so you all can go back, play through this, work through this. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, in one minute, we'll give you the... Uh, the what nows, the next steps of what you can do if you want. If you're like, man, I'm excited. I want to keep doing this real-time 3D stuff. 
uh, we'll show some links. So this is what you can do now. So I know we mentioned kind of joy creates learn content. Uh, so what that is, that's our platform, learn.unity.com. It is 100% free. It costs you this much dollars, uh, mm -hmm. zero dollars. Zero. And you can just learn. So we have these amazing pathways. Um, I actually have them pulled up. So I'm going to steal the screen. Steal it. Really fast. So these are our learn pathways. And so we have Unity Essentials. This is really where I would recommend you all start if you've never touched the engine before. Dive in here. It's mm -hmm. got incredible videos on the industry, what different jobs are out there, how to think about it. But then it also does a deeper dive into how to move around and manipulate the engine. And you actually publish a game at the end of it, right? You publish a yep. small demo. You do. After that, pick a path. If you want to stay in the art world, Creative Core right here. Mm -hmm. It's got all of the artistry stuff that Unity utilizes. So you can dive more into materials, shaders, audio, all that fun stuff. If you want to do the Cody stuff, if you want to get a little nerdy, uh, you got junior programmer right here, which will teach you all the basics of C-sharp programming. And at the end of it, you'll really be in a position to start prototyping and building and looking for junior programmer jobs. And a virtual reality is your jam. We just released this VR pathway in what, like November last year. So I guess it's a year old now. So the, the course, we actually released the course in November last year, but the pathway actually just released this June. So we okay. added extra content. So it's now like a full pathway from start to finish. And I heard a rumor that perhaps VR has a sibling that's coming out here this year. That rumor too. Yeah, it's something about augmented reality. Mm. So we're always updating this platform, right? Joy is yep. hard at work keeping it up to date. We're always so building content for it. <laughs> yeah, so please like use it, engage in it, jump on it. It's all free to you. And that's yep. learn.unity.com. Uh, Joy, if you want to refresh the slide deck and then steal back, I added a link to that last page. Um, mm -hmm. because it dawned on me that there might be some folks who aren't students or educators here. And so I wanted to make sure people knew exactly how you can get the engine um, in all specific situations or outcomes. Yes. Allow me to steal back. Doop, doop. And here we go. There's the refreshed plan. Is that uh, it? That is it. Yep. Okay, very good. So if you're a student, college, high school, you're 50 going back to college, whatever. If you have an email address at a institution, hit that. If you do this link right here, the plan.unity student, you can actually get a free Unity license. So that one right there. Oh, I guess I got to put the HTTPS in there for it to translate mm -hmm. as a link. Huh? Unity, oh my goodness, bit.ly plan dash Unity dash student. Uh. And then if you're an educator, if you teach and you want to teach Unity or you want to learn Unity and then teach it, or whatever, we have free educator plans. And if you're none of those things and you just want to dive in and start practicing with the editor, we have, you can just get the editor for free as the personal edition. It's not as robust as the education edition. It's not the pro version, but it'll do everything you need to do in these demos we've shown you. And you can just go to store.store.com, uh, store.unity.com slash download. Y'all, I am not good at typing apparently. <laughs> um, but you can go here and get the unity personal edition for free as well uh and then dive into these learn pathways and start learning diving deeper and getting these skills built up and start building those portfolios that we've been talking about and again all of these things on this page are completely free um mm -hmm. if you are an educator and you're like man i want to teach this in my classrooms or i want to dive deeper or if you're a student who just wants advice this is my email address uh i also dropped joy and i's linkedin at the beginning mm -hmm. of this thing Mm -hmm. um add us on linkedin send us messages we're always happy to help where we can um that me yeah so send us messages and that's the end we did it we did the whole thing that us Ta -da! i'll go ahead and stop sharing yeah if anybody has any questions before we wrap up we'll answer last yeah. questions and then be good Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Joy and Thomas. Like you've been amazing moderators today and we actually love the session. So um, people, shall we give like a round of applause in the chats to our speakers, our instructors for today? They're well. Who is excited about unity? <laughs> like I am like, I I don't know. I'm just blown away right now. Like applying physics, applying material science, which I'm so passionate about, applying tech and games, like it's crazy, it's mind blowing.
all at the same time. And so um, we thank you so much for being here. Um, I would just like to ask, do we have any questions, any last questions from the audience before we round up? Yeah, definitely happy to answer anything at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, while, while um, we wait for the last questions, we have a, a survey we'd like you all to take just um, to share um, your experience with us and for us to be able to give you even better sessions, better events. And so I'll be sharing the link to the post-event survey. It will take less than a minute or two. And so can you just fill it out? Let us know your thoughts on this event. Did you love Thomas? Did you love Joy? Do you love Unity? And yeah, what are you looking forward to going for? Thank you. I've dropped it in the chat. They kindly fill it. Yep. And I think people have asked why you got interested in Unity and everything like that. Now, I just like to ask. If you weren't doing anything Unity, what should you be doing for each of you? Oh man, so uh, it's funny. The reason why I'm hesitating is because literally my private life is about Unity as well. When I'm not working at Unity, <laughs> I'm building games in Unity for myself. So <laughs> I, I don't have a non-Unity life. Uh, Thomas, you start. I don't know how to answer. Uh, this. My goodness, um, it would definitely uh, be the yeah. hard moment there. You know, if if I had if I had all the options, right? Like, I really I really do enjoy fighting games quite a bit. I try to travel for them as much as possible. Um, so I think that would definitely be an option. I think also I really like building and creating stuff. So for me, I think like let me hold on. Let me just I'm gonna turn my video off real quick. Hold on. Hmm. Uh, while Thomas is grabbing his thing, um, yeah, just going back to the fact that I really love storytelling. I'd probably be doing some form of that somehow. But again, like it's so closely tied with Unity, maybe traditional <laughs> film. Uh, yeah. yeah. Thomas, what do you have? So I like building <laughs> controllers. Um, so I wonder if maybe if I wasn't doing Unity, maybe I try to like build a bunch of these and sell them. They're fun. Mm. This uh -huh. is a Castlevania one I built because I like that you show. You can actually lot. build like a whole company. <laughs> Maybe and just sell video game controllers to people. I don't know. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. Maybe like, something like that. Yeah. When you're doing something you love so much like this, sometimes, yeah, you get carried away. Like Joy, even <laughs> outside of Unity, is still Unity, right? So it, it, just, it's so funny to do. It's like, yeah, oh, like, I'm done you... with work. Time to go back to Unity. <laughs> like, we all, we'll all like, we meet up because we're in different cities, but when we go to like the office to meet or whatever, we generally spend our free time talking about like the games we want to make. It's pretty fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and so like it, it was just great to hear. And I think we don't have any questions. So I'll go ahead and close out. And so um, on behalf of our CEO and founder, Diana Nyamicha Wilson, who is here, uh, we are so excited that you came to share and we are very great and privileged to have you in our midst to share about Unity and to teach us all this fun and amazing stuff. It's been an hour of very um, impactful knowledge. And then uh, we hope that after this session, we'd actually practice more like excited. And I'll just make you get on one of these pathways. Um, so we'd also like to thank every one of you, our audience, for coming. Blacksis Fellows, you came out to show out. And we thank you. We hope you've learned a lot. Now, at this moment, we would like for you to share one thing one thing you learned today. Just share it in the chat here. Let's know one thing you, you are taking away from this session. It could be about their lives, but it could also be about what you've learned in Unity. I have learned um, about um, criticism, how to deal with criticism, even though that's not the point of the session. I've learned that, yeah, you have to think about who is actually making this criticism. Are they actually qualified to make that criticism? <laughs> And um, what's the outcome? Is it helpful? If it's helpful, then I'll take it. If not, and so like just drop one of your key learnings in the chat. And I'd like us to take like a group picture, a screenshot for our records. And I know like you guys are so up for it, right? So 
let's take a, a group picture. I don't know if all of us can go up on camera. Yeah, but then if if others can't, we the three of us can just and we take the picture. So I'll give 30 seconds. The next 30 seconds, if you'd like to be on the group picture, kindly just put on your camera and then we take it. Okay, I'll and the people are coming up and I see all the beautiful ladies in the house. <laughs> Samisha, Elom. Yeah, so I just changed my view to gallery so we can have a very nice group picture. So in the next one minute, and I have to say, it's so amazing to uh, have more women in a Zoom meeting than men. This is so cool, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, um, it, it's so amazing. And that's what Black Sisters in STEM is all about. We are building the largest talent pipeline for Black college women. And so expect more, expect more. Next time you'll be holding a session with us, hundreds <laughs> it's yeah. so exciting we we need okay. more women we need everybody make stuff be awesome i believe in you <laughs> joy believes in you you had it so um let's go on and take the group picture so we take three pictures so on the count of three three two one yeah that's one then the next one we can all do like some fun anyone yeah everyone's like giving two right so on the count of three three two one yeah and then the last one anything just freestyle you can be so weird <laughs> thomas are we lost again yeah like why <laughs> like that so on the count of three three <laughs> two one so um it's been an amazing time thank you all so much thomas enjoy it's been a pleasure to have you all here it's been wonderful thank you yes and so all of you who have joined we'd like you to also go ahead and share these learnings on our discord and all those who didn't come let them benefit from this we'll um yes yeah, so i just like to ask thomas and joy can we get the deck to share with them later on oh of course yeah um, absolutely I'll email it to you Ooh. right now. Okay. So we'd get the deck to send over to you guys. And we would also share with you the recording of this session. So you didn't miss anything. And you can go on and practice. And maybe in the next 10 years, you'll be instructing us. <laughs> there would five be the years. Right. Ten's five too years. long. You, Ten you can already much. found like you, you could be the CEO of a business in 10 years. So you can start uh, teaching much sooner. You can be the next. No, you've leader. been in you've been in Unity for so long, right? <laughs> yeah, it's been a while. Right. yeah, so five, five. They want five, maybe even three, right? <laughs> Forget it. Two, two years. I want to see industry leaders in two years. Two years, right? So um, this has been it's been so amazing, and we thank you so much. So let's all go off mute and say thank you to Thomas and Joy. Like, they've been so amazing. Like, they've been so, so amazing. So let's all go off mute and say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thomas and Joy. Thank you. So um, it's been an amazing <laughs> session. See you all next time and have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye. Be safe, y'all. It was great. We'll see ya. Bye. Bye. Bye.